The following is a clip from the live breakdown and analysis of Giuseppe Roberto Tarantino's dissertation specifically on the open gaming license submitted in 2019 for a PhD in the field of intellectual property law. This dissertation is publicly available. The link to it is in the description. Okay, so this is how this operates. And so if you haven't ever actually read through the OGL document and trying to understand it, it is, kind of, it is a legal document, there's legalese, so we're going to get into this. The analysis in this part is based on the text of the OGL, the text of which is reproduced in, appendence, in Appendix H. Or you can grab any other book that you've got that's uh, D&D compatible and uses the OGL and look at the back of the book. And a series of frequently asked questions, postings made by Wizard of the Coast. The OGL, because we've got the frequently asked questions, that's come up a lot here. The OGL is in the past few days. The OGL is a relatively short document of less than two printed pages consisting of 15 clauses, one of which is a copyright notice. Only a single version of the OGL, version 1.A, has ever been released. Oh, let's see where a footnote is. 164. Section 9 of the OGL contemplated WotC publishing updated versions of the OGL, but no such updates appear to have ever been publicly released. So at this time, only 1.A has ever been released. And I, I, I believe it would be, you know, I, that to me is synonymous with, uh, with authorized. Only, you know, that it was released, it was authorized, and that was it. The, operational of the, the operation of the OGL relies on two foundational defined terms. Open game content, OGC, and product identity. OGC is defined to mean the game mechanics and any additional content clearly identified as open game content by the licensor, but excluding any PI. PI consists of three sets of concepts, concepts which can, at the election of the licensor, be deemed to be product identity by clearly identifying them as such. Identifying marks, so including brand names, logos, and registered trademarks, non-textural graphic elements, including symbols, designs, depictions, and photographic representations, and other game components, such as creatures, storylines, dialogue, character names, magical abilities, and supernatural effects, in each case excluding any content identified as OGC. Critical to an understanding of how the OGL uh, operates is a recognition that the OCG, OGC and PI designations are made at the election of the licensor. These are made at the election of the licensor and that some licensors are more generous and offer more restrained uh, and others are more restrained in what they choose to designate as OGC. By way of illustration, imagine a publisher who releases a 50 page RPG book that contains text including various new rules, statistics for four new character classes, and descriptions of various in-game personalities and storylines, and visual images such as drawings of in-game personalities and maps. A relatively generous OGC PI declaration would state that only components of the 50-page publication that are the PI are the name of the game and its logo, and the name of the publisher and their logo, and the visual images contained in the book, with all other content being declared OGC. An even more generous approach would include the visual images. Actually, uh, uh, Mark Tasson was talking about that on his stream last night. That uh, if if he goes forward, I mean, and that is going forward, but with the, if the cool name RPG stuff goes forward, he thought, well, hey, maybe we could even release images if it's if it goes large enough. Which that would be cool. That'd be cool to actually have uh, images released under the open gaming content. So if you've got if you need pictures of goblins or whatever, the goblin picture is there, and you could actually use it too. That could be cool. Um, a much more restrictive approach to the OCG, o OGC PI declaration would state that PI consists of the name of the publisher, their logo, the visual images contained in the book, the names of the in-game personalities and their attendant descriptions, and the text relating to two or four new character classes. By means of the OGC and PI definitions, the OG enables a licensor to license content in both open and closed basis and to use the two concepts to apply to different elements contained within a single publication. Oh, I came up with something that I was looking at earlier here. Each component of the content of a gaming product can be categorized as either OGC or PI. The distinction is crucial. As described below, OGC is licensed on an open basis, whereas the licenses, licensees are prohibited from using PI in the absence of a separate agreement with the owner of the rights in the PI. As described by Adam Jury, a game designer and commenter in the RPG industry, the OGL allows for the intermingling of open and closed content. That innovative approach to license construction distinguishes the OGL from its predecessor open source and open content licenses, which generally only contemplate a binary approach to licensing software, code, or expressive content. 
Either the work being licensed is licensed on an open basis or it's not. With the OGL, the dense sets of material that tend to constitute RPG products can be licensed in different ways, even if they are the same product. So, section three and four. Of the OGL, erect the con con uh, section three and four of the OGL erect the con conditional permission mechanism familiar from open source licenses. By using any OGC, the user is deemed to have accepted the terms of the OGL, and in consideration for agreement agreeing to use of the OGL, the licensor grants a perpetual, worldwide, royalty-free, non-exclusive license to use the OGC. That's our limit. Perpetual, worldwide, royalty-free, non-exclusive license to use the open game content. Sections 13 of the OGL provides for automatic termination of the grant uh, permission if any failure to comply is not cured within 30 days. Sections 2 and 10 of the OGL contain the share-alike and copyleft mechanism of the OGL. Section 10 requires that a copy of the OGL be included with every copy of the OGC that is distributed, which is why we've all got that in the back of our books. Section 2 stipulates that any use of the OGL, OG, OGC, must be accompanied by a notice indicating that the OGC may only be used in accordance with the terms of the OGL. The OGL applies to any OGC containing a notice that it may be the OGL applies to any OGC containing a notice that it may only be used in accordance with the OGL. And by virtue of section two, all OGC must be accompanied by such a notice. C, the provisions of the OGL must not be modified. And D, no other terms or conditions aside from the OGL can be applied to the OGC distribution using the OGL. By means of section two and 10, any content that a licensure has declared as OGC is permanently open and its openness perpetuates through all downstream works that include the OGC in question. A licensee cannot revoke the OGC status of content and cannot claim proprietary rights in OGC that they have licensed. So that was an important sentence, which is why I marked it when I was going through making notes. Any content that a licensor has declared as open game content is permanently open, and its openness perpetuates through all downstream works that include the OGC in question. A licensee cannot revoke the OGC status of content and cannot claim property rights in OGC that they have licensed. <laughs> Vision asks, I wonder if any lawyers from Wizards of the Coast or Hasbro are in the chat. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> It's possible, I suppose. Thus, if a licensor A declares content X to be OGC, licensee B can use X in accordance with the OGL and can incorporate X into B's product on that basis, even if no other content in B's product is declared OGC. X remains OGC even when included in B's products, and X remains available to licensees C, D, and E to use in their own projects, as products, subject, of course, to their compliance with the OGL in respect to their use of X. The use of PI is further addressed in Section 1 of the OGC. So the use of IP is further addressed in Section 7 of the OGL. OGL licensees agree not to use any IP or PI unless separately licensed to do so. Further, PI cannot be used as an indication to compatibility. And the OGL licenses are restricted from using trademarks to indicate compatibility or co-adaptability in absence of a separate agreement. What's the, now, this is important, right? So this is what's distinguishing... OGL content from other uses of trademarks that we talked about much earlier in the stream and that uh, Ryan Dancy was talking about. So that's why you don't see Wizards of the Coast trademarks on the open uh, the OGL books saying, hey, this is compatible with Dungeons and Dragons, because if you agree to the OGL, you cannot do that. That's part of this. WotC explicitly took the position that by agreeing to the OGL, a licensee agreed to limit any other rights the licensee might have to use PI with particular sensitivity regarding trademarks. It's important to note the optionality of PI and OGC declarations. A licensor can elect to designate some or none of its content as PI. If a licensor designated all of its content as PI, there would be no need to use the OGL. WotC itself elected to designate a significant portion of the content of the D&D product line as PI, but licensors who use the OGL make varying decisions about how extensively to identify content marked as PI. The remaining provisions of the OGL 
address mechanical and interpretive matters. Section 5 consists of representation from any licensee who contributes OGL that they own or control the necessary rights to that contributed OGC. Section 6 requires licensees to update the copyright notice contained in the OGL to include attribution for all OGC designated content and the licensee in use and licensee uses in any OGC they distribute. This results in some OGC products containing copyright notices that occupy large portions of a printed text. Section 11 restricts licensees from using the names of contributors of contributors of the OGC in advertising and marketing unless permission is obtained from the relevant con uh, contributor. License from using the names of contributors. Uh, restricts the licensee from using the names of the people who have wrote the material in advertising and marketing unless permission is obtained by the relevant contributor. Section 12 and 14 address the effects of judicial severance, enforceability, and the inability of a licensee to comply due to court order, statute, or regulation.